Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Lee Liberman Otis, the Senior Vice President of the Federalist Society and the Director of our Faculty Division. Uh, and uh, this uh, Supreme Court preview is co-sponsored by the Faculty Division and the practice groups. And so we're very grateful to Dean Reuter and his team for all of the help that they've given us. Uh, we are delighted to welcome everybody back to the Mayflower. Uh, fun to fun to be here, and uh, uh, without further ado, I will turn things over to Jan Crawford, uh, who will uh, introduce the panel and uh, 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 get us going on talking about what I'm sure will be a very interesting term. Sometimes at these events, you know, you have to. Uh, uh, make them interesting, but uh, in this case, I don't think that we have that challenge. So, uh, welcome again, and uh, looking forward to the panel. Um, thanks for uh, having us all here, Lee, and to the Federalist Society. Uh, that is so true. I mean, how many times have we gone to these term openers, and you know, we spend 30 minutes talking about ERISA, not to, to diss on ERISA, <laughs> and then you know, two months later, we've totally forgotten about it because they've taken all these other great cases. Obviously, this is a term where we know at the outset that it's going to be, uh, I think, one of the most significant terms, uh, certainly that I've covered in, since 94. Um, and also, you've got all these other things swirling around, uh, whether it's you know, the future of the court, the politicization of the courts, uh, the shadow docket, uh, other cases on the horizon. Um, there is a lot uh, to talk about. Uh, and we're really fortunate that uh, the Federalist Society has gotten together an incredible group of people to talk us through. You guys know, I'm sure, you're an informed audience, uh, who all our speakers are, but I'll just briefly, for the two people who might have been under a rock the last few years, uh, I'll just tell you who they are. Uh, professor Robert Cattra, he's a, a professor of law and legal history at George Washington University. He uh, is a prize-winning author as well. His books, uh, highly acclaimed, focus on the Constitution, gun control, slavery, segregation, ra racial hierarchies, legal systems here in the US and abroad. Um, obviously, these are all pressing issues, crucial importance, and of great relevance to uh, some of the issues before the court this term. Tom Goldstein, next to him, is, I mean, again, uh, how many times can I say a man who needs no introduction? Um, he's argued 30-plus uh, cases uh, before the court, taught constitutional law, and is, of course, the uh, founder and visionary behind SCOTUS blog, which uh, you can't really overstate the contribution that has made to the public's understanding of the Supreme Court, uh, to the point that I really think it's impossible to imagine uh, the court without SCOTUS blog even though I know a lot of people complain to you guys about decisions that the court does. They are not, in fact, the Supreme Court, but a lot of people think <laughs> that they are. Um, and then uh, to my left, uh, yeah, this is my left. Uh, so I have a hard time with left and right. I don't know. It's really. Um, uh, Canon Shemigan, who, of course, you guys all know and, and have seen argue for the court or heard in the case of the last couple of years, a uh, highly regarded Supreme Court practitioner like Tom, he's argued, 30-plus uh, cases uh, before the justices. Managing partner here in D.C., uh, Paul Weiss. He also leads their appellate practice. Uh, and I will add that he's a huge fan of the Kansas Jayhawks. So, you know, we can also talk basketball. Let's right? not talk football. I, I didn't want to bring up the Chiefs. <laughs> <laughs> I, wasn't, I didn't. The Ravens fans might want to do Chiefs, Chiefs are fine generally at this time of year. The Jayhawks, not so much. <laughs> Um, Carrie uh, Severino is, well, wait, I thought they just had a loss. They did. Yeah, we won't I mean, talk about that. Know, Lamar, I mean. Uh, all right, sorry. Uh, uh, Carrie Severino, uh, down at the, the far left, is uh, Chief Counsel of Judicial Confirmation uh, Network, um, Judicial Policy Network. She is co-author with Molly Hemingway of the book uh, on the Kavanaugh Confirmation called The Kavanaugh Confirmation, Ju Justice on Trial, The Kavanaugh Confirmation, and future of the court. So obviously, uh, there is a lot for Carrie to talk about. Not only is she an expert on the court and legal issues, but she's well versed in uh, some of the controversies over the confirmation process. She clerked for Justice Thomas, I think who can, uh, we can all kind of say was certainly some of the issues in his confirmation foreshadowed a lot of the things that, that we have seen subsequently. 
Um, so this is our esteemed panel. Um, we're really fortunate to hear what they have to say about this term. I'm going to, uh, what we're going to do is kind of start by, uh, we've all kind of broken down uh, who's going to say a few words about various cases. Uh, then we're going to have a couple questions, conversation, and then uh, we're going to kick it off where we'll have questions from the audience, uh, and then there's a live stream. We have a really great group here, by the way. It's weird, like I don't know how many of you, I, I haven't had banquet food in like at least a year and a half, but it was good chicken, it was good. Um, but we also have a live stream uh, for those of you who were not able to be here in person with us, and we will be taking questions through the live stream too, which will pop up on this iPad, allegedly. Uh, and I warn you, I'm not very technologically savvy, so if I mess this up, I, I apologize, but we're going to try that. So um, we're going to start uh, here to my right. Uh, Professor Kachar will kick things off. Uh, he's going to be talking about New York State Rifle and Pistol Association, and um, obviously, as I'd already mentioned, uh, some of his work, and this makes him someone that we need to hear from on this, and its implication uh, for some future Second Amendment cases. So, Professor, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, just a few words. I'm, I'm going to say a few things about uh, New York State Rifle and Pistol Association uh, versus Bruin. Uh, this is highly significant. The Supreme Court uh, broke new ground uh, in the case of Heller uh, versus McDonald uh, in, uh, uh, sorry, Heller versus District of Columbia uh, in 2008. Uh, recognizing the Second Amendment as protecting an individual right to arms. Uh, it followed that up in 2010 uh, with McDonald versus City of Chicago, uh, indicating that the Second Amendment uh, applied to the states. Uh, and by doing so, it also, uh, I think, expanded the incorporation doctrine uh, that we might want to get into. But in any of the, the court breaks this new ground but then we've basically, since 2010, had silence from the court. Uh, the court did in 2016, in the case of uh, Caetano versus Massachusetts, uh, indicate that, uh, among other things, that uh, the Second Amendment certainly applied to modern weapons, including uh, stun guns or electric guns that uh, were unknown technology uh, to the framers. But largely, the court has been absent uh, from the Second Amendment fray. Uh, so a number of questions have been left un unresolved. Uh, does the Second Amendment encompass the so-called assault weapons? Uh, what standard of review should be applied uh, in Second Amendment cases? Uh, and perhaps most significantly, does the Second Amendment apply outside of the home? Is there a right to possess a firearm uh, for self-protection? Uh, outside, uh, outside of the home. By and large, uh, the court has ducked that this question, and my sense is that the strong that the justices that we might characterize as being supporters of a strong reading of the Second Amendment uh, have not been voting for cert, or at least not not gotten four of them together, because they very much feared there was not a fifth vote for a more uh, expansive, if you will, uh, reading of the Second Amendment. However, uh, with Bruin, uh, we have uh, the fourth vote and the court uh, going to look at this. Um, this, I think, is particularly significant. Uh, most circuits have rejected the notion that there's a right uh, to carry outside uh, uh, the home. However, two circuits, uh, the, the Seventh and, and the District of Columbia Circuit, have, in fact, recognized such a right. Uh, and indeed, it's followed practice. Uh, that is, in I believe 45 of the 50 states, one either does not need a permit uh, to carry a firearm for protection outside the home, or one is in a shell issue jurisdiction. That is, the jurisdiction must uh, issue a permit to carry uh, absent uh, some disqualifying feature. Uh, we have other jurisdictions, and New York uh, is one of them, where uh, essentially the uh, carrying is, uh, the right to carry is discretionary to local officials. Uh, they can decide, uh, not necessarily based on any uh, firm criteria, uh, who uh, can or cannot ca uh, qualify uh, for a carry permit. 
New York City, I think, has been notorious uh, in this regard uh, as a jurisdiction that has been tremendously restrictive um, as to who gets a license to carry. And the short answer in New York City is the rich and famous get licenses to carry. Ordinary people simply do not. Uh, Bruin is not dealing with uh, New York City per se, uh, but nonetheless with uh, New York State and its uh, discretionary uh, uh, carry uh, scheme, which I'm sure will inevitably, uh, the decision will inevitably uh, affect uh, the New York City scheme. Uh, so here I think what we see is the, the court, I think, seems ready to come back to the Second Amendment uh, and, and say that, look, uh, regulations of firearms uh, and the idea that the Second Amendment uh, controls the regulation of firearms has to be taken more seriously uh, by local jurisdictions. So it'll be interesting to see wh how this comes out and... Uh, I'm at least keeping my fingers crossed that uh, uh, the court is going to give us the Second Amendment with some teeth in it. Uh, thank you. And we're going to come back and have a conversation about some of that, too. Uh, that, so if you guys have questions, remember the Second Amendment case and, you know, why um, it seems to be working for rich people and not poor people is an interesting point, I thought, too. So we're going to go now to Tom. Uh, Goldstein, he's going to discuss uh, Ramirez versus Collier and uh, the so-called shadow docket, which uh, obviously we're talking about cases on the docket that the justice will, will be hearing arguments in. They've already scheduled them through uh, the beginning of December, but um, the shadow docket has uh, been responsible for a, a lot of uh, pretty important uh, changes. So, Tom, thank you. Thanks so much, and thanks to the Federal Society for having me. So the Ramirez case is a death penalty case, and it did come to the court in a kind of emergency posture. Mr. Ramirez was scheduled to be executed in Texas and shortly before his execution advanced the claim under both the free exercise clause of the Constitution and a federal statute called RELUPA that he needed to have his spiritual advisor in the death chamber with him, which Texas was willing to allow. But he wanted his spiritual advisor to be able to do two things that he said were important to his religious beliefs. The first is to lay hands on him and the second is to state an audible prayer and Texas would not allow either of those things. Uh, a stay of execution was denied in the lower courts. He then filed a SIR petition and a request for stay of execution. The way that death penalty cases tend to work is that the justices do hear from the condemned inmate in you know, the days and sometimes the, just the hours before the execution, and it can produce a variety of important rulings on substantive questions of constitutional law and other things. Uh, as the justices struggle to get the issue in front of them resolved without interfering with the state's sovereign right to carry out the death penalty, assuming that the, they haven't found it to be unlawful in some way. Uh, in this case came to the court in the middle of a controversy over what the court was doing with its emergency docket. Uh, Will Baud uh, had coined the term shadow docket and it's kind of taken on another meaning than I think it was originally intended. It was called the shadow docket I think in the first instance because people just weren't paying attention. It was stuff happening in the shadows where the court would hear oral argument in you know, 60 or 70 cases every term, we would pay a lot of attention to that, but there was another body of case law coming out of the court where the court was acting without having briefing and oral argument because it had to deal with things in an emergency posture. The Supreme Court has a shadow docket in the same sense that every court has a shadow docket. District judges are asked to issue preliminary injunctions, uh, temporary restraining orders. Those issues go to the courts of appeals where they're asked to act on an emergency basis too, and so too, of course, the justices. And the death penalty cases are uh, you know, an example where there's really not much choice if the court is going to be able to handle the request for an emergency stay of uh, execution, it is it by its nature an emergency. Um, nonetheless, uh, I think this became pretty controversial in kind of the public space, mostly because of ideologically freighted objections to what the court was actually doing in the cases. That was too, true in two different ways. One was that the Trump administration in district courts around the country was getting hit with nationwide injunctions on a variety of different things uh, and also losing uh, a variety of cases in front of district judges who and court of appeals judges who'd become ideologically disaligned with the Supreme Court 
and the Trump administration solicitors, solicitor general did not hesitate to go to the justices and ask for stays, injunctions, orders lifting stays and the like. And a conservative majority on the Supreme Court overwhelmingly granted those requests. And just so the raw number of requests uh, for these sort of emergency uh, actions by the Supreme Court without briefing and argument went up. And that drew a lot of attention when those were granted. The second thing that happened is that there were a number of cases that involved very important issues in an emergency posture that the justices were resolving. That was particularly true of um, uh, election-related disputes in the last presidential election, but also in, co in uh, the context of COVID, where uh, houses of worship, schools, and the like came to the court advancing principally religious claims that they were being discriminated against by state COVID restrictions, when a store could be open but a church could not, and the like. Uh, and the justices granted several of those requests, again, uh, largely on ideologically divided lines with pu significant published dissents and the like. In general, I think that the objections to the so-called shadow docket are very, very overblown for one principal reason, that is I can't find any of the cases that were decided without briefing and argument that would have come out differently after briefing and argument. Uh, now, given what Canon and I do, it's very important for us to say that it is absolutely essential you pay lawyers a lot of money to brief and argue cases in the Supreme Court, and you should ignore what I said about it not making any difference. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, the, it is no surprise that the court finds itself in a posture where it has to uh, act relatively quickly. And I would expect that this is going to become, a, you know, uh, will, will remain a significant area of controversy. The court did grant cert in the Ramirez case and issue a stay of execution and issued an expedited briefing order, a super expedited briefing order, so that they're looking to have the case decided by the end of the year. I think it's an attempt to balance the need to resolve the religious question in the case uh, with the state's, as I mentioned, interest in carrying out the execution. So they're going to, they had briefing over the course of this month. They issued very specific orders saying exactly what they wanted briefing on and they've already set the case for oral argument. Uh, in the coming weeks. Um, but the Biden administration, I think, is going to face an array of challenges uh, up to the justices, seeking stays of various policies, maybe in the immigration context from the states and from other affected individuals. Uh, and I would expect the court is going to, you know, continue. I don't think it's intimidated uh, in its use of uh, its emergency powers. Uh, so I think we'll continue to see a lot of controversy over this it, as people kind of object to the outcomes and are using the process that it's in an emergency posture and there hasn't been briefing argument as a kind of an independent basis for, you know, raising concern. You could see maybe even vaccines. Sure, yeah. absolutely. Uh, vaccine mandates would be an excellent yeah. example. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we'll maybe come back to the nationwide injunction issue as well. So. Um, now we're going to turn to Cannon, and he is going to discuss Carson uh, versus Macon and also uh, other issues uh, related to the First Amendment. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Jan. And let me say, first of all, what a pleasure it is to be here and to be here in person. I have to say that I think that this is probably the longest dais in Federalist Society history. Um, <laughs> for those who can't see, and I don't think our lenses are wide angle enough, I'm sitting between Carrie and Jan, and I couldn't reach out and touch them even if I tried. So we are certainly observing social distancing here. And this is really the first uh, rubber chicken event I've been to, though I'm told the chicken was not at all rubbery. Uh, but this is the first one of these that I've been to since the pandemic. And it's um, so wonderful for that event to be a Federalist Society event. I realized recently that um, I've been a Federalist Society member now for 25 years. And so uh, I'm fond of saying that I'm a card-carrying Federalist Society member, but the reality is that my card is getting somewhat tattered. So uh, Gene, Dean, I don't know if I can get a new one. Uh, for the next 25 years, but um, uh, I, I really uh, value this society uh, so much, and so thank you for having me. So I'm going to talk about an ERISA case. Um, I'm going to talk about Hughes versus Northwestern. Just kidding, Jan. I'm not going to talk about it. it is actually a fairly important ERISA case. For those of you who are at uh, big law firms, you may be familiar with it, um, but I'm not going to talk about uh, alleged breaches of fiduciary duty. I am going to talk about the First Amendment docket. 
And I would uh, respectfully quibble with just one thing that Jan said at the outset. You know, I think for the journalists, this is a big term. I think if you look at the work of the court as a whole, there are three really big cases already on the court's docket, and then there are 24 other cases. And uh, I'm going to talk about the second of the big cases, and then Carrie is going to talk about the third, the one that has been very much in the news uh, uh, lately. Um, I'm going to talk um, first about um, Carson versus Macon, which is a religious liberties case. And I think the reason why the press is so focused on this Supreme Court term is that we have cases in probably the three most visible high profile areas of the law, um, gun rights, abortion, religious liberties. Those are the areas that probably get the most public attention. And those are the areas of public constitutional law that I think in many ways tell us the most about how justices look at the law. And particularly with three new members on the court in the last four years who have had relatively limited ability to opine on those issues, this term is going to tell us a lot just based on those three cases alone. And the court is about halfway through filling its docket, so of course the court could potentially put other significant cases on the docket, but I'd be really surprised come June if those three cases aren't right at the top of any story that, that Jan or, or any other reporter does on the work of the Supreme Court. So um, let me just briefly tell you about Carson versus Macon. We'll have ample opportunity to discuss this case. This is a um, free exercise case. It's going to be argued on December the 8th, so the briefing is just getting going. Uh, you may remember that the Supreme Court um, decided a case just last year called Espinoza, a case coming out of Montana, that um, essentially said that it was um, impermissible under the First Amendment for a state to discriminate on the, uh, in, in a program providing um, scholarships to students based on the religious status of the school that the student is attending. And, you know, the question in this case is whether the outcome should be different when um, a, 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 a state is not uh, uh, barring students from uh, using aid to attend a school based on the religious affiliation of the school, but rather focusing on the curriculum and whether the school, in fact, promotes uh, faith through the cu curriculum. And what Maine does is it has a tuition assistance program, the stated purpose of which is to essentially provide the option of private education for students, particularly in rural areas, who might not have access locally to a public school. But at least as the program seems to operate, and there's always a little bit of, of nebulous around, ne nebulousness around the edges when it comes to this, it seems as if the real touchstone is that the state looks to whether or not the school is providing sectarian educational instruction, which again is defined in terms of whether the school promotes its faith through the curriculum. Now, it might seem like this is sort of a, a, a very fine distinction between the sort of status of the school and the curriculum of the school. And yet the state um, uh, defends this, and the First Circuit accepted this distinction, you know, based really primarily on a Supreme Court decision called um, Locke versus Davey, which was a decision, I believe, in 2004, um, in which the Supreme Court upheld a Washington state law that essentially excluded students from a state funding program who majored in, um, educated, in devotional theology, which was uh, essentially defined as religious instruction that was designed to prepare students for the ministry. And the court said you can um, permissibly, a state can permissibly exclude uh, students from a post-secondary scholarship program when that is the use to which the funds would be put. And Locke versus Davey was a seven to two decision at the time with Chief Justice Rehnquist writing the opinion. The only dissenters were Justice Thomas and Justice Scalia. Now, you know, obviously we have a, a different court today, and indeed I believe, if my math is correct, that Justices Breyer and Thomas were the only members uh, of the court from Locke versus Davey who are still there today because it was a year before the Chief Justice and Justice Alito joined the court. I think we have a court that is generally more friendly toward religious liberty, and so if I had to bet here, I think I would bet on the challengers, but I think the really interesting question in this case, and this may be a refrain that um, other members of the chorus pick up as we talk about other areas of the law, 
is whether the court will say Locke versus Davey was simply incorrectly decided and therefore there is no basis for the distinction or whether the court will in fact attempt to narrow um, Locke versus Davey. And there is a, a sort of a fascinating um, passage in um, the challenger's brief, which is again the only brief that has been filed uh, so far uh, suggesting that this is how the court should narrow Locke versus Davey. And, and the brief says, the most that could plausibly be read into the court's opinion is that a departure from strict scrutiny is warranted only where a religious exclusion shares the characteristics of the exclusion in Locke itself. That is one where the exclusion does not require individuals to choose between their religious beliefs and receiving a government benefit. Two, where the exclusion targets only a particular religious use. And three, where the targeted use is essentially religious endeavor. And so I think this is sort of a classic example where uh, if the court wants to, it could narrow Locke versus Davey, you know, pretty much to its facts. Uh, but then the question becomes, you know, is there a sort of principled basis for doing that or is the court doing that because it's simply unwilling to go so far as to expressly overrule a precedent? So I think that's the most significant First Amendment case on the court's docket. I'll just very briefly um, put in a plug for one of my own cases because, as Tom pointed out, we are in private practice and any lawyer from private practice has to talk briefly about something they're working on. Uh, I just filed a brief bright and early this morning in a very interesting speech case. I think probably the most interesting, maybe, I think really the only speech case on the court's uh, DACA, but, but if there are others I'm not thinking of, I'll just say it's the most interesting, a case called City of Austin versus Reagan National Advertising, which is a follow-on to a case that many in the room will be familiar with, Reed versus Town of Gilbert, on the question of how to analyze speech restrictions imposed by municipalities. And this case involves, of all things, billboards. I feel a little bit like the guy by the swimming pool in The Graduate when I say, you know, the future is billboards, but um, uh, billboards will stand in for plastics in this analogy. Um, uh, billboards are, of course, very important. They play a very important function in promoting speech, particularly at a time when so many people tune out of other uh, speech platforms, and it's become increasingly important for uh, non-commercial speech, speech on public issues of note, as anyone who lives in a part of the country where, where uh, billboards are, are, are more common can attest. And the question in the case is whether the city of Austin, um, keeping things weird as is its want, um, whether the city of Austin can say that you can have a digital billboard on your premises but that you can't have a digital billboard that is off-premises. And whether or not something is on-premises or off-premises is defined by um, the content of the billboard, whether the billboard is advertising services at the location where it is, or whether it is advertising services that are provided elsewhere, or potentially um, advertising services that don't really have a, a, a location. And that includes a, a lot of types of uh, a commercial speech which are classified under Austin's uh, ordinance as the equivalent of advertising. And the question is whether or not that is a content-based distinction that is subject to strict scrutiny. The Reed case, which said that a town couldn't uh, essentially differentially treat directional signs for churches was a content-based uh, restriction that was subject to strict scrutiny. Our position on behalf of the billboard company is that this is indistinguishable from the ordinance at issue in that case. And I think that this case will tell us a lot about whether the Supreme Court continues to have you know, a pretty muscular view of First Amendment protection, including potentially in the context of commercial speech. So that's the end of my advertisement for my own case. Well, and being a journalist, I'm going to say that this is the biggest term we've had, because I have to justify my... <laughs> if you're going to do your private You need practice. to go to Austin and do a piece on this, Jan. Jan so. um, but, you know, one of the things you touched on with Locke versus Davey, and uh, I think that Professor Kachal really started us off with, uh, when, with the court's decision to take on the gun case, is, uh, you know, what the, the new Supreme Court is going to do. I mean, you know, obviously a new justice can make a new court, but do these new justices mean that we're going to have a lot of new law, differences in approach to the law? What are they going to do with some of the precedents that we've seen and how are they going to develop them? And um, that's true in all these big cases that we're talking about. And I think uh, to end with Carrie here, uh, no more true uh, of all the cases this term uh, than Dobbs versus uh, Jackson Women's Health, which of course is the court's decision uh, to take a, a look at Mississippi's 15-week abortion ban, uh, and it includes in that case uh, 
a consideration of, of, I mean, right off the bat, should Roe versus Wade uh, be overturned? So, I mean, once that case is on the docket, it's going to mean no matter what, if, if there's 69 ERISA cases, it's still going to be a major term. So, um, obviously, the stakes are pretty high on this for both sides. And, uh, Carrie, if you could just, uh, that will conclude our, our summary. So, get your questions ready. Um, and we're going to end on, on that uh, introductory summary with Carrie. Thank you. Great. Well, uh, coming to you from the far left edge of the bench, as Jan said, it's one of the rare opportunities for, I have to fill that role. Um, I'll, I'll uh, try to summarize the case that, that I think, I, I don't even think I need to go too far into the facts of the case, um, because I think that's one that anyone who's who keep, keep an eye on the court has probably seen ad nauseum coverage of, um, along with the Texas case that, that is now um, still in the shadow dockets uh, area there, but is also touching on abortion, um, but in focus more on some of the big picture issues that this is going to uh, going to bring up, as Jan said, that's what everyone wants to hear anyway. So. Um, for the quick summary, Dobbs has to do with the Mississippi law that, that effectively prohibits abortion following uh, 15 weeks. There are some narrow uh, exceptions, but really effectively prohibits it uh, after 15 weeks and, and tags that to the time uh, both, both concerns about fetal pain, uh, given the, the nature of um, the uh, dismemberment abortions that are generally happening at that age, and, and then also a significant increase in uh, risks to maternal health uh, for later term abortions at that point. Now, this, as, as Cannon clearly laid out, the court doesn't love to overturn precedent, and yet I, I will point out that every member of the court at one time or another has overturned precedent. So they all love talking about how stare decisis is wonderful, except for the cases that they want to not over, uh, maintain a case that's, that they think is incorrect. That's not to say they don't care about stare decisis, except potentially with the exception of Justice Thomas. But um, it, it, I think it is to say that the, the questions, there, there are serious questions as to whether to overturn things, and nobody on the court thinks we always must follow cases that are wrongly decided. Um, but one thing they do prefer to do is find ways to not have to straight up overturn a case if there are other ways around it. This. Um, this case, this term, I think is unique because it prevents, it gives the court very few other options. It's a, it's a really stark decision. So there have been cases in the abortion area, potentially, for example, in the past, where uh, people, and I think Justice Thomas has written concurrence is saying, well, you didn't actually ask us to overturn Roe in this case, so we're not even, I'm not even going to address that, even though he's the one member of the court who has explicitly said, I think Roe is wrongly decided. Here, they are clearly, um, Mississippi came out with a very strong brief saying, yes, you do have to overturn Roe. Um, here, it's hard to imagine that the court would go back and uh, do uh, what, uh, you know, the potential is for the Lockheed Davy case and go back and carve the case down to its facts. It's going to be hard now, 40-some years later, for them to go back and say, actually, this really only applies to certain, you know, a, a one woman in Texas in, in 1973. They're, they're, they're not going to be able to do this. It's not, it's not this kind of case that you could, that you could ignore in American uh, life. It's also difficult because, um, like the, um, you know, for example, the Fulton case last term where the, the, the court was being asked to overturn Smith, there was sort of this alternative of, but also we think we can survive even under Smith. There's not really that option in this case. I think everyone, uh, uh, you know, whatever they think about Roe and, and, and Planned Parenthood, it, I, don't, I don't think anyone has come up with a, a clear explanation to me of how, under existing Supreme Court precedent, you could possibly have a 15-week abortion ban surviving uh, the precedent as we have it. So what is the court to do? I think particularly in a court where you have uh, a, a, a clear majority of the court, five if not six members who are committed to um, an approach that is originalist or textualist, at least most of the time. I don't think the chief has ever said he's a full-time originalist, but you know, the idea that your only alternative is to um, come up with a effectively new standard, I think is going to be a really, make, puts them in a very difficult position, because you have justices who might prefer to say, I don't want to have to deal with this case, but they don't have the option of, for example, that they would have in Heller, the Hellerstadt case a few years ago, where they could have said, you know what, we don't think this, is, this rises to the level of a burden, because obviously it does under the current precedent. They don't have the chance that they did in June Medical to say, well, we're just going to decide this on the, on the question of do they have standing in the first place. That, that is the court just narrowed it down to this one question. So um, I think that, that is what is going to create a, a, the most interesting case we've seen in probably a, a long time. There's, I think there's a lot of room. It's interesting because on the other hand, there is a lot of room legislatively to come up. There's, there's a whole lot of lines in there that you could draw that are different than what the court has right in its current jurisprudence now. And we're sort of seeing them all in the court's 
um, docket and in the in the shadow docket coming up now. There's cases that are that are in the wings or being held that that address abortion in lots of different ways, uh, whether it's uh, eliminating discriminatory abortions, abortions discriminating the basis of sex or race or Down syndrome status. There's a couple different states that have those laws that are working their way up or already on petition. Uh, there's a whole series of different um, bans at different ages. There's the Texas case, which we'll talk about in a second, that said that instead of picking the 15-week line, picks a six-week uh, line for uh, outlawing abortions. And I think um, so there's a lot of different middle grounds, and I think if you, when you do surveys across the country, you see that Americans fall into less, less often than in the extreme camps, they fall into those middle grounds. The challenge is those, those are all really le inherently legislative uh, middle grounds to choose, and I think it's gonna be very hard for the court to argue, you know, how, how, how could we, for example, say, Mississippi's law, that seems reasonable, we'll, we'll, we'll find a, a line that allows that, but then, for example, doesn't allow the Texas law or some some combination thereof. So, um, so that's going to be that's going to be their real uh, challenge. I think the other challenge is this case is going to highlight uh, a trend that we've seen over the last few years. I think increasing, and that is the level of hysteria and intimidation really being brought against the court. I've heard the number of people who've already asked me about, you know, is this going to increase the likelihood of. of and attempts to pack the court, for example. The idea that we expect then that the response to a decision that angers um, the, the, the members of the party that's currently in power, it, that they would have take retaliatory uh, action against the court, that I think should, should be an a, a issue of real concern. Um, I think the fact that the day that the briefs were filed in response in this case, there was a in-person demonstration at Justice Kavanaugh's personal family home is another aspect of that intimidation. I, I was glad to see people from across the political spectrum, spectrum condemning that, saying, you protest at one First Street, don't, don't go to the person's home, especially someone with young children uh, like Justice Kavanaugh. But I think uh, we all need to gear up that for this is going to be a term that's going to take all of those intimidation things to the next level. I mean, remember um, Senator uh, Schumer's comments during, it was, it was, I guess now two, two years ago in the spring, I'm going to tell you, Kavanaugh, I'm going to tell you, Gorsuch, you know, all of his threats to the court, you won't know what hit you. That, I think, we're going to see ramping up. And I think it's, we should be very concerned about that um, being the method of argument to the court uh, by other means. Um, even sometimes we've seen it in amicus briefs that are the proper means for argument to the court, but going back to the Second Amendment, we saw that in the, in the last gun case that the court had where you had several Democratic senators led by Senator Whitehouse who were especially saying, if you don't v w rule the way we want, we're going to uh, attempt to pack the court. Um, I think it's also going to have a major impact, I think, in, in American society, whatever happens. So we're going to have a huge explosion on what, whether the court rules, you know, which, in whichever direction they rule. And frankly, even if they try to rule down the middle and come up with a, a um, invent a middle ground, I think because you're going to have either out, outrage from the left or I think a serious concerns from the right that um, will be a real threat to, I think, the progress of the conservative legal movement if you have uh, original justices who, who claim to be originalists and then engage in an act of inventing a new standard, because I think that's going to be uh, that there are a few options. And I think also we're going to see future cases on these issues regardless. If, if the court is continuing to stay in the business of, of, of addressing abortion under the Constitution, they're going to be, there's no way out of this continued, uh, uh, you know, third rail issue, uh, because we already have this case from Texas, and I said there's cases from Tennessee, Missouri, Arkansas, all, all in the wings. Uh, I think from the perspective of the, uh, from, you know, from my perspective, from the perspective of, the, of, of an originalist approach to the Constitution, as well as maybe a, a self-defense of, of we don't want to have to deal with this issue, the court might be wise to actually say, let's just go with what the Constitution says, which is nothing on this, and leave that uh, to the uh, to the states to deal with wouldn't give pro-lifers what they want either because I think you'd see a wide range across the country from New York to California and from Texas to Georgia to all these other places um, but I think it still would um, I, I think that would be the, the, the both the principled way and and maybe the rip the band-aid off approach is also going to be the easiest way to keep the po politics down um, I don't, I don't want to go too much longer but I, but there's also you know there's obviously this Texas case in the wings I think Dobbs is more significant because it's going to be decided on the merits more immediately um, and the, the decision in that case was more 
it was it was a sh the the stay decision really had a lot to do with the procedural aspects of that case, which has to do with the idea that the state actors in Texas aren't the ones enforcing the law. It's any individual uh, that can bring a lawsuit, and so it's it makes the case very difficult to bring a pre-enforcement challenge until someone actually brings a challenge. Who are the proper defendants? And you can see this challenge even with the attorney general's attempt to now um, get into the act of, of suing uh, Texas. Not only does their lawsuit it premise itself kind of on the idea that there's a freestanding right of the Department of Justice just to sue people who who they think violate or, or, or sue to, to get rid of laws that they think are in conflict with federal law. That isn't something that's normally been the position of the Department of Justice, but now is in this brief. But it's also a real question where they effectively have said everyone, uh, we're suing Texas, but basically anyone who can sue under Texas law is also an agent of Texas. And that's, that is a, that's a seven billion person um, you know, party, and if, if you're concerned about due process and people have being aware of their their entrance into a lawsuit, all of us have effectively been, <laughs> been implicated in that because any one any one person could sue that. It's, it's a real challenge uh, for that case. So I will uh, I'll leave it there because there's lots of time for discussion still. Um, thanks, Carrie, and I'll just follow up with you first since we were you know on the issue of of Roe versus Wade. I mean, obviously, there's some argument that uh, if the court were to uh, pull the thread of Roe in this case, uh, would that also unravel other cases, including the marriage cases? Uh, you know, what impact beyond abortion rights uh, would you uh, potentially anticipate, and what will you be looking for there? I don't, so there, there obviously is a, are, there's a whole body of abortion law in of itself that would be affected, but uh, I don't think there's any other cases that would necessarily fall as a result of changing that because I just don't think there's a lot of other cases that rely necessarily on Casey or Roe. Um, maybe the other, the other members of the panel will have an impact. If, if for example, there's eff effects in other areas of the law, I think it's more likely that they're stemming from the same source, which is we now have a majority of the court that uh, adheres to originalism and textualism, not because they're stemming from, oh, this, you know, or Burgerfell or whatever other case was resting on Roe as its foundational um, tenant and therefore now is going to fall. Um, and then I guess, you know, when we, when we think about the significance of this term and the three major uh, kind of, you, we've summarized some of those, you've heard the excellent summaries uh, that will always, uh, I mean, hugely important to everyday American life. There are other issues on the horizon which are also important. We could talk about some of those too that I think raise, um, you know, it's, <laughs> some of the justice will be interesting to see how they to react, for example, to the affirmative action case uh, that is now pending from Harvard. Uh, they requested the views of the Solicitor General's office, which of course we can imagine what those views are. So they've kind of delaying that a bit. Uh, what is, I'm just gonna throw this out to the panel, whoever wants to take it. Uh, tell us a little bit about your thoughts on that case, whether they will take it. Obviously, the Chief Justice has been known to be now somewhat unpredictable, as Kerry says. Whether, you know, what, But I think he has been pretty predictable on issues of race. Um, so what you're thinking on uh, the Harvard Affirmative Action case, whether they will take that, and is the court going to set clear lines there? Anyone? I'll just... I mean, I do think it's inevitable that the court is going to take an affirmative action case. Uh, it's another area of the law that is in transition as the courts become more conservative. Uh, it seems like the most logical candidate. It does, you did have the feel that when the Supreme Court asked whether the Biden administration thought that the Harvard program was constitutional, that everybody already knew the answer and that a majority of the Supreme Court wasn't particularly interested, to be honest, in the Biden administration's views on uh, that question, and so it had the feel of being a delaying tactic, as you suggested, and that tactic being a too pejorative a term, but just like, we have enough that we're dealing with right now, let's get a little bit more input, but basically we're gonna, we're gonna deal with this question later. So I do think that we'll get a brief from the administration, but one that comes after January, uh, and therefore not in time to, for the case to be heard this term. But uh, I do think that religion is the principal area in which the court has not yet turned the corner, uh, uh, jurisprudentially, if you talk about a wide uh, swath of, of case law, you have gun rights where the body of law just hasn't developed at all. 
Uh, and then you have narrower questions like abortion where the court may pivot in the opposite direction. But affirmative action is still out there. And I do think that the, the, the limiting agent on jurisprudential change at the Supreme Court right now really is the Chief Justice. You do see him, for example, when we talk about the emergency orders, joining the three more liberal members of the court uh, more often than any other conservative on the court. And when you have an issue like race where the chief is seemingly fairly committed to colorblindness, uh, you would really expect the law to move uh, and for there to be you know, significant roadblocks to be enacted uh, to affirmative action because it's a private case rather than a, a public university uh, and therefore it's under a statute rather than the, under the Equal Protection Clause of the Fifth or the Fourteenth Amendments. It's conceivable that we might not learn a ton because of the, the statutory overlay to the cases, but in general I think that uh, people have correctly recognized that the handwriting is on the wall for limitations on uh, uh, affirmative action as to whether they can draw clear lines unless it's going to be color blindness there's going to be uh, it's it's going to be difficult to know exactly what the rules are and I think there are concerns uh, among some that if you have a rule that says well you can take races uh, into account as a part of a multi-factor uh, analysis trying to build a uh, diverse student body that the admissions officers are in the back going uh, yes uh, and not really taking that limitation seriously and and I don't know how it is that the court can intervene and 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 in some way that would prevent that from happening uh, and I don't know that it really wants to absolutely do that because I, you know the court is not in the business of trying to stop diversity uh, and stop you having a you know a, a a, a class that is representative of all kinds of different backgrounds, but I think they are, they are, a majority is quite concerned that we're doing it by checking the boss, box of race. Professor Kasho, I'm going to uh, ask you to weigh in on this in light of obviously uh, some of the, the, your rich body of work and scholarship. Uh, any thoughts on uh, the Roberts Court now on these issues of race, affirmative action, and then we could circle back as well to some of the points you made uh, on the Second Amendment and what you might expect to see from, obviously I think we might have a pretty good sense of Gorsuch, but what you might have, a, where you might sense this new court might go on that. Well, I think I, I would agree with, uh, with Tom that uh, the court is going to look at affirmative action. I'm not sure they're gonna do it uh, this term. Uh, but, and I think also that the court is gonna be mindful of, of the consequences, that is any kind of categorical prohibition on using race uh, as, as, a, as a tool for admissions. Uh, I think a number of justices are going to look at, at the consequences of that and probably say, we want to trim back, but I'm not sure we want to go that far uh, with that. Uh, I've, of, I've often said what our court should do is look at what uh, uh, the Brazilian Supreme Court did about affirmative action in 2012, which if you read Portuguese, I'll, I, I could recommend a great decision uh, uh, to read. Uh, but basically, uh, 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 Ricardo Lewandowski, the minister who, did, uh, who wrote the decision, essentially said, look, Brazil owes a historic debt uh, to uh, the Afro-Brazilian population, the indigenous population, and affirmative action is a reasonable way to uh, 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 to do that. I don't think we're going to get that, but I do think there's going to be some reticence about totally killing off uh, uh, affirmative action as a possibility, uh, race-based affirmative action as a possibility, uh, in part for diversity reasons, in part for, uh, uh, for other reasons. As to the Second Amendment, uh, it's interesting. I'm very encouraged by the fact that the court has, in fact, uh, uh, taken Bruin. Uh, uh, my guess is that you wouldn't have gotten uh, the, the uh, uh, agreement for cert uh, or votes for cert uh, without the expectation that there were in fact five to say that there was a right to carry uh, outside the home. Also, I suspect there are members of the court, uh, again the people who are, are, are favor a strong reading of, of the Second Amendment, who are somewhat, have to be somewhat disturbed by what the lower, many of the lower courts have done with the Second Amendment, which is that many of the lower courts have essentially said, 
well, Heller really didn't mean anything. We'll just sort of allow business as usual and kind of ignore Heller as sort of a, uh, a constitutional faux pas uh, on, on the part of the court. And I suspect that uh, there are members of the court, certainly those who, who support a stronger reading, who want to send a message to the lower courts. Yes, we really meant it. You've got to take it seriously, and you've got to develop standards that uh, 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 to follow and that send messages as to what is uh, and is not permissible. Uh, the Second Amendment is real, and it's here to stay. Jan, can you know, I? Uh, uh, oh, yes, I don't want to but take I'm going to you next. But, but, all right. Uh, no, go ahead. Uh, well, no, no, no. So we're going to say, and then because I have a, which reminds me of something. What, okay, sure. What well, said. I just want to pick up on on something that Tom said and, and something that Professor Cottrell said. So, you know, first of all, with regard to the affirmative action case, you may have seen this week there was a news report that the law firm that's been defending Harvard has charged more than twenty-five million dollars in legal fees to my alma mater. My initial reaction to that was, and I need to raise my billable rate. Um, <laughs> A couple of uh, serious observations about the Harvard case. Um, you know, first, I, I think that this is an area of the law where we have relatively few data points about the newest justices. And so I think that if the court does take the Harvard case, and I agree with Tom that it seems highly likely that it will, it's going to be very interesting to see what Justices Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett have to say and how far they are willing to go. And I think the degree of movement if the court rules in favor of the challengers is going to be really the thing to watch. You know, the other thing I would just pick up on, which um, Tom alluded to in uh, uh, explaining the court's decision to ask for the views of an entity whose views can, can safely be uh, uh, presumed, is that I think that the court in recent years seemingly has been acting somewhat strategically with regard to the timing of Supreme Court review. You know, when I clerked at the court now um, almost over 20 years ago, you know, the court would just grant review when it got a petition that was worthy of, of, of review. There was not a lot of hand wringing or relisting. Relisting was barely a thing back then. And now it seems that whenever the court has a big case on the docket, the question is not just whether the court's going to grant review, it's, it's when and whether the court's going to grant review this year. In the Dobbs case, the court took eight months to grant review. Now, that may not have been strategic. It may just have been that, that there were behind the scenes machinations trying to get to the four votes required in order to grant review. But I think in the Harvard case, there's no sign of that. There is a real sense that um, asking for the views of the federal government kicks the ball down the road potentially into next term. And at a time when the court already has uh, the significant cases that we've discussed on the docket for the 2021-22 term, you could see the court thinking, boy, if we load up on you know, the, the only hot button area of the law that we don't have on the docket, it could <laughs> really um, uh, set the pigeons loose. So uh, I, 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 I think that there is you know, sort of good reason to think that that's probably what's going on. On the Second Amendment case, I would just add one very quick point, which is that, you know, I think that that case is, it presents sort of this, you know, interesting originalist question of whether the right to bear uh, firearms uh, extends beyond the home. But I think the practical question is the one that, that Professor Cottrell referred to, which is that, you know, the court has really not clearly opined on the standard of review for these Second Amendment claims. That is an issue on which some of the newest members of the court, like Justice Kavanaugh, have opined, but that's an issue on which the Supreme Court as a whole has not yet opined. And that's critically important because whenever we talk about a constitutional right, the first question, as I mentioned when I was talking about the billboard case, is what's the standard of review? Is it subject to strict scrutiny? Is it something subject to something lower? And that has enormous practical consequences for the lower courts because I think what we've seen in the wake of the Supreme Court's decision in Heller is that lower courts have not been very protective of uh, the Second Amendment right that the court recognized there based largely on their unwillingness to apply a more stringent standard of review. So anything that the court says on that, I think, will be noteworthy. You clerk for Justice Scalia, right? Am I remembering that right? So, you know, one of the things I think, looking at, you know, say Justice Gorsuch and where he may diverge from Justice Scalia, um, you, know, if, if, you know, anything that you may or may not have noticed there. And then secondly, I do think there, I mean, I think we just basically assumed, um, what, what year are we in now? 
21 term, <laughs> you know, the 2019, 2020, that uh, they were just punting on a lot of things because it just, let's just let these new guys get on the court and we don't need a big controversial term. Um, so to your point to being strategic, if any of you guys want to weigh in on that later too, I, I think it, it's pretty hard not to think that it was. But go, looking now as, as we do have this new court, and obviously the Supreme Court, you know, it's like a, you take a picture, like a Polaroid picture, and it's going to take, I knew you guys, I know there's some young, young Polaroids are what we used to have in the old days, um, and you'd have to like, get come, you know, that, that outcast song. Anyway, um, so, you know, it takes a while for the, the, the picture to come into focus. Um, what do you think we will see this term? I mean, obviously, we've got all these cases. I mean, starting with the, you know, you could just go down this table. All of these cases are going to tell us a lot about where these justices stand. I mean, you know, starting when you carry lay that out. I mean, that's just, um, what are we going to be looking for in some of these cases? Uh, patterns, uh, where these different justices may or may fall, what we will learn from these justices, how they may differ. Uh, from the justices that they replace. So, I, I mean, I'd just love to get all of your thoughts on that. I was going to start with you. And yeah, Carrie, I a, know with the, uh, you know, with Justice Thomas, obviously Justice Scalia thought that Roe should have been overturned. So now Justice Thomas being the only justice on the court. Um, I, they, I don't, I think the, the concern from the abortion rights organizations is that this court, like with the uh, Second Amendment case, would not have taken this case, uh, the old court. Uh, they would have been very easy for them to just deny cert in this case. So why, you know, just that right there was like, whoa, it's a, it's a new day. Um, so if, I would love to just get your thoughts on that and then anything else you guys want to weigh in on. Um, and then we're going to take some questions for the audience, from the audience. And then if there's anyone on the live stream that has any questions, um, feel free. I, I, I've just gone. Carrie, go ahead. All right. Um, well, yeah, yeah, obviously, there is a we have a, we have a different uh, set of justices than we have the last few years, and I think uh, that is naturally. So, in some cases, the shift is not going to be as dramatic. Obviously, the Gorsuch to Scalia distinctions are probably more minor, um, and uh, obviously, the Barrett to, to uh, Ginsburg is going to be the biggest shift. Um, but even Kavanaugh's approach as, as compared to Kennedy, particularly when you're talking about Kennedy as the longtime swing vote on the court, it's very significant. And I think um, what we're going to, really the question is how much, and we keep on, we've talked on several different ways about, you know, the justices, to what, what are they really looking to to decide their cases? Are, we, are, are they looking to, uh, what, are the, what are these consequences in various areas? Or are they looking at what is the legal standard here? Um, and I think that's going to really be what's going to drive the way, the direction the term goes. On some, I, I, from my perspective, in terms of the, you know, do you take, what case do you take and when, there's a lot less, um, I don't know, I, I think there's a lot less impact of your judicial philosophy on that. I don't even think I know fully what Justice Thomas's own philosophy is on that thing. Do you take a case that is undoubtedly an important issue that maybe there's a circuit split on, but you are pretty sure you know, five members of the court would decide it the wrong way. Do you, do you take that case? Maybe you do, maybe you don't, right? I don't know that there's a clear, like, this is the, this is the correct answer to when you exercise your, um, your jurisdiction if you have, uh, like the Supreme Court, the chance not to. But I think there, it is much harder once you've taken a case to say, okay, how, do we, are we deciding these cases based on the rule of law, based on the legal standards, or are we, are we trying to game out various other things? I think that's where it, it becomes a real concern, and I think it, it becomes a, a concern for the way the court is viewed. I, it was ironic on Constitution Day, I was in the middle, I had a debate um, for the Maine Federalist Society uh, with, with Professor Randall Kennedy, who effectively argued that the Supreme Court is really just a, a, another type of legislature. It's just that there's nine of them and they have life tenures. And I think we run the risk of having that be the perception of the American people if you're looking to every other possible you know, in, indicator in the world except for what does the actual law say in a case. Uh, it's pretty clear to me that most of the justices on both sides of the aisle don't want to be viewed as just a legislature. You've had uh, Justices Thomas and Barrett say as much almost explicitly recently, and I think Justice Breyer effectively has said that. He, we, they don't want to be the politicians. And so I would say if that's the case, then make sure that you're looking to the actual decision-making thing. There's going to be a lot of gaming out in the public and in the, in the media and everywhere else about, oh, well, you know, how, how is the court shifting this way? The fact of the matter is that that is, that is the reality. Every time we have a new justice, uh, the court, it, have, they say you have a new court, right? It looks, it's going to look a little bit different. But um, I think the, 
what, what would be the best for the court as an institution is for the Amer American people to be able to say, and we recognize that these justices are making the decisions based on their own best estimate of what the law is, even if I maybe disagree with what that is, but they're looking at the law and not, and not um, you know, some other external uh, factor. Um, I, I don't want to bring up the other members you know, the of the other panel, thing, but I have a when couple of thoughts we can, on this. You know, Carrie touches on a couple if, different things in yeah. addition yeah. to what I, I have. So from the original yeah, question, if I, sorry. Yeah. If I could just actually respond brief, briefly to that, I would agree that justices look to uh, what they think the law is, but I think that might be the very heart of the problem. What, you know, what does a particular justice think the law is? Does a particular justice think the law is what is in the text or what we can deduce from uh, the framers' understanding? Uh, does a justice believe that precedence uh, is the law? Does a justice believe uh, that the right policy outcome is the law? So I, I would thoroughly agree. They, they all believe uh, that when they are writing their opinions that they are writing the law. Uh, the real question is, what does this particular justice believe the law is? Uh, you know, th that I think is the, the, sort of the heart of the uh, the matter and the controversy. You know, the 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 former, the late Chief Justice Rehnquist, you know, he, he talked about public opinion mm -hmm. at the court and how the court, obviously the justices can't follow public opinion. They, they're not, you know, they're supposed to follow the law. But, you know, at the same time, the court doesn't really get too far ahead of public opinion. And how much do you think this term, when you think about all the issues hanging over this court right now with the threats of expanding the Supreme Court, the Presidential Commission, uh, the, the heightened controversy just innate in the cases that are on the docket right now. These are cases that you know, everyone's going to be paying attention to. Um, how, how much of a, a concern is that? Well, I think don't justices, among other things, they have to balance a number of things, including uh, what they think the law is, you know, whatever their source of the law is, uh, but also uh, a feeling that, one, we want to get five, you know, if I'm writing a, an opinion, I want to get five, uh, five people to, to sign it. You know, I have to get, it's the rule of five. Uh, but also, I don't want to appear ridiculous. Uh, let's take, um, let's take uh, the Scalia opinion in Heller. Uh, okay, if you're Justice Scalia, you believe, indeed, uh, the Second Amendment was meant to protect a right of individuals. The history shows uh, that they were in part talking about a militia of the whole, of the whole population, or at least the whole uh, adult white male population. Uh, one logical reading of that would be that automatic weapons uh, should be protected. Uh, you know, if you expect people to serve as part of a militia of the whole, they should be able to have the weapons that the army has. Perhaps not all of them, but at least the small arms that the army has. Uh, Scalia deliberately correct, crafts uh, the Heller opinion to exclude that. Uh, yes, it might be the logical conclusion uh, of his reading of the Second Amendment, uh, but one, he realizes he's not going to get uh, uh, five uh, votes on that. Uh, Kennedy is, is certainly going to, to leave at that point, uh, if not others. Uh, but also, it's one that uh, is not going to get the support of the public uh, and uh, the, uh, the bar and the bench. Uh, so there is this kind of juggling, even amongst the... Uh, uh, the strictest textualists and, and, and originalists. Tom, you know, Justice Breyer, and you guys have to make your prediction on Justice Breyer, by the way, so be thinking. Um, you know, he's, he's, and he, uh, he really gives incredible presentations uh, to groups across the country about the court and its institutional integrity. Um, just, he's really, I think, is a real treasure in terms of just being a, presenting the face of the court. Um, and he will say a lot of times in these speeches, you know, that the court doesn't have standing armies. Uh, this is, shows our democracy's functioning. They make these decisions and then people follow them. How concerned are you or should we be about 
uh, some of the things that we've been talking about in terms of packing the court, trying to, to influence various decisions on both sides of the issue. Um, how concerned are you about the court's actual setting aside how the justices it might affect way, the way they may see an issue, about the public's view of the court, and, and how, you know, I mean, the confirmation process, as we've discussed, has, has gotten so poisonous. I mean, is there a time where people just, is it a concern that people just might say, you know what, I'm not really going to do that? Well, uh, just to maybe link the two sets of questions, but to start with Justice Breyer, I think it's overwhelmingly likely that he'll retire this term. Uh, it's, you know, the justices are aware of the political cycles, and it would be very surprising uh, if he were to ignore what happened with respect to Justice Ginsburg, for example, um, and decide to go through another Senate election cycle to me. Uh, with respect wait, to let's, let's just circle back with everyone on that first. Does, does everyone agree with that? I mean, obviously, uh, w there was tremendous pressure on Justice Breyer to retire. I think it really kind of hurt his feelings. You know, like he's really done a great job and they're just trying to throw him out like the trash and he's going to sit, no need for him to go this year because Democrats will still have the Senate next year. Uh, and let him go have a term here where he can like actually have arguments at the Supreme Court, right? So that suggests, yes, he would retire at the end of this year. We have a big confirmation battle with Democrats still in control of the Senate. But they don't always, I mean, Rehnquist, you know, from the, the other side, I mean, Rehnquist didn't retire when many people on the right thought he should have. He just got lucky that Bush won a second term. So who, know, I don't know, like what, y'all make your predictions. Yes, does Justice Breyer go? I think I probably agree with Tom on that. I Notice that's not very quotable. He's not going to let anyone put that's, that in writing. That's my default answer whenever I'm on a panel with Tom Goldstein. <laughs> um, it, it's definitely possible. I mean, if he does retire at the end of the term, it also means that the elections happen in the shadow of a confirmation hearing. And what does that do? To, what does that do to Biden's flexibility in terms of who he wants to appoint? Who, who does he want to be the face of this debate on the, on the Supreme Court? So it's, it, you know, it, I think there's also the factor of how much more pressure do we see? Because I do think you're correct that the level of pressure we saw toward the end of last term may well have backfired on efforts to get Breyer off the court. So will people learn their lesson and like step back a little and, and give him some space? Or will, is, are we going to see that ramp up toward the end of that term? That may actually affect in a almost reverse psychology <laughs> way what he decides. And then Professor Breyer. I was going to say I genuinely don't know. Uh, the, uh, Too easy. You know, Again, really quotable. We can hold you to that next year. <laughs> okay. I think Breyer has a commitment to the idea that the court is not simply a political institution. That uh, uh, that you know it does it, you know he doesn't look at the election calendar uh, in in terms of. Uh, uh, deciding whether to come or go. He, you know, he's got, as I think all the justices do, a personal commitment to the court as an, as an institution. And because that commitment doesn't want to see, uh, seem to be, you know, resigning simply for political purposes, on the other hand, uh, you know, there is, you know, he has certain uh, desires as to which way he wants the, the court's jurisprudence to go. And that he realizes if he's replaced ultimately by a Republican, uh, the, the person who, who takes his place will not be uh, obviously the same as him in terms of the way he would uh, vote or, or write opinion. So uh, I suspect it's a dilemma for, for Justice Breyer, quite frankly. I think that's excellent. I mean, that is that's kind of what I was trying to say earlier when I was like mushing around with, you know, he does really care about the court. Mm -hmm. He gives speeches. He's a he's such a, a tr tremendous you know advocate for the court as an institution when he goes out and talks to these groups and, and people uh, you know who may not really even know much about the Supreme Court at all that he doesn't want people to think that it's political like he's just stepping down but you know if he does step down and then Tom I'll let you have the last word and then we're going to take questions but if he were to step down which you think he will that obviously won't change the court. Uh, like some of these recent battles, uh, especially with Justice Ginsburg, but even with Justice Kavanaugh, that have caused all of this um, hyper focus on the court, uh, the suggestions that the court is illegitimate, uh, that uh, we should have more members, we have a presidential commitment, I mean, commission. What, 
what does that do to the court? I mean, we're talking about Justice Breyer being, you know, kind of just the spokesman for the integrity of the court as an institution um, and its legitimacy. This is the flip side of that. And, and what is the concern? Is, the, are you, is this something that we should be worried about, that the court is in danger of losing, um, I mean, credibility, which it, it has to have for people to kind of follow along. They don't have standing armies. Well, the court is a really easy target. It doesn't really have a very good way of arguing back. Um, and anybody who dis disagrees with the decision just will inevitably decide that, to call it essentially lawless and it's completely made up. It, the only thing that you know is you know, truly adhering to the laws if you agree with it. Uh, is generally the way that the public reacts to decisions of the court. I think that I would be, to link this back to your earlier question, I'd be looking to two things from the three new justices in terms of where there will be fissures uh, among the, you know, the broad and conservative majority that go beyond just how, what they think about a particular area of the law or question. The, the first is pacing. The big disagreement between the chief and Justice Scalia really was, you know, we're going to have one decision that's going to move one step, then another, 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 is how the chief looks at things. Uh, and Justice Scalia was, you know, we are on the clock. Let's just get this right and get all the way to the end result now. Um, and Justice Scalia's, you know, concern that they might lose a majority almost came to pass if, if the, you know, the confirmation cycle had worked slightly differently. Um, and so it'll be very interesting to see how aggressive the new members of the court are as the court inevitably does change direction on some of these questions. And the second is just uh, adherence to precedent and how much true gravitational pull precedent does have. Uh, or whether the, the members of the court, particularly when it comes to constitutional law, where they all feel an obligation to get it right, uh, are um, you know, less concerned about adhering to you know, the, the a prior set of precedents that they think is wrong. And the reason those two, I mentioned those two in, uh, points in the context of your question about legitimacy is those are, those tend to be areas of focus. Uh, if the court were to suddenly overrule Roe versus Wade, that's quite different from doing it over the course of 15 years, for example, and the public becoming kind of attuned to the fact that the court was getting out of the business uh, of that area of the law. Um, and uh, there can also just be an enormous amount of criticism of the court for overturning its precedent and essentially, uh, you know, the, the, the composition of the court determining the meaning of the, of the Constitution. Uh, in terms of whether the court's legitimacy is in question, um, you know, it, it, I really don't think so. I just think that for whatever reason, uh, it has built up an enormous uh, font of public respect uh, I don't see any danger whatsoever, essentially no matter what the court does, uh, of the public essentially kind of abandoning that institution as one that they will, you know, regard as legitimate. Um, I know that there is a school of thought that abortion is such a high profile question and Roe is so embedded in the public consciousness that that would be kind of a, an earth shattering uh, ruling, but I, I would be very surprised if it you know, manifestly and seriously affected the court's uh, public reputation. In terms of whether court packing is a realistic thing, there is certainly a, you know, a significant interest on the left uh, in that, given the ability, given you, know, you have the other branches of government, that you could pass a statute conceivably and have the president sign it and change the number of justices on the court, obviously inducing a tit for tat. Uh, as the majorities and uh, parties in control change, you would have to get rid of the filibuster. Uh, and I don't think that the Democrats have or are going to have a majority uh, for that. I, you know, Joe Manchin, I can't imagine saying, I'm going to get rid of the filibuster so we can you know, add seats to the Supreme Court. Um, so I don't think that's really, really on the table. But there would, if Roe is significantly limited and Heller is significantly expanded, uh, then you'll see, you know, you will see much, much more, more pressure for that to happen. Yeah, can I just respond to a couple of things really quickly? Um, first of all, uh, you know, I think with regard to the replacement of Justice Breyer, assuming that he does step down next year, that I'm not sure I agree, Jan, that it wouldn't change the court. I think Justice Breyer has, in some respects, been the most pragmatic well, of I agree the Democratic with that. appointees. Yeah, no, no, that's and I think true. we could I mean, end up with, with sort of more splintering if mm -hmm. um, uh, you have, you know, three Democratic appointees you know, all of whom take a, a, a fairly consistent, more, more liberal approach on some of these issues. So I, I think, 
It remains to be seen, and as Kerry says, the identity of the nominee may very well depend on the broader political climate. Mm -hmm. That said, I agree with Tom on, on one thing, which is that I think that the thing to watch over the next Supreme Court term is going to be just how incremental is the court in, in so many of these areas that we've been talking about. And I think that's true, by the way, both with regard to constitutional interpretation, but also with regard to textualism. You asked me about Justice Scalia and Justice Gorsuch. I'm not sure if we ha have a more um, textualist court now than we did four years ago when Justice Scalia was on it. He was such an outsized influence when it came to questions of statutory interpretation. And I think even among the Republican appointees on the court, they're sort of all on points on a spectrum in terms of just how you know, committed they are to textualism. And uh, I, I, I think that's also sort of an interesting subtext to watch. But I think really the interesting question at the end of the day here is that there's no doubt that you know, the court's legitimacy is under threat right now because the level of rhetoric and criticism of the court is higher than I can certainly remember at any point in my career. And I think the real question is, you know, can the court protect its legitimacy under this really unprecedented level of fire? And what's the best way to go about doing that? And I think Carrie very sort of perceptively addressed this when she said that in many ways, the biggest threat to the court is that it is perceived to be acting legislatively. You know, there was a Supreme Court justice who once wrote an opinion about the threat of the court being viewed as politicians in robes. That was my former boss, Justice Scalia, in his dissenting opinion in Casey, now almost 30 years ago in 1992. And while he wrote that opinion in the context of abortion, I think the lessons of that opinion stretch across entire areas of the law. And he warned about you know, the loss of public confidence in the court if it was perceived just to be acting legislatively on a case-by-case -case basis. He warned about the increasing politicization of the confirmation process. And goodness knows we've seen that come to pass over the intervening 30 years. And so I guess you know, the real question here is, what can the court do to um, protect and restore confidence? And you know, I think that what the court has to do is to remind the American people that it's all about the rule of law and applying broader legal principles and, and not just uh, putting a finger to the wind and deciding cases uh, on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. But you know, as Tom rightly points out, uh, you, know, you can make the argument that the best way to do that is to start from first constitutional principles, which could involve revisiting precedents. And in this environment, you know, overruling precedents inevitably leads to uh, an outcry among those who, who disagree with the outcome. And so I do think the court is in a little bit of a sort of challenging political process, uh, posture right now. We haven't even talked about the uh, presidential commission on the Supreme Court, which I believe is due to report in November, just weeks before the oral argument in the Dobbs case, which is kind of ironic um, timing. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I just think that this is an era that none of us have ever lived through where people are, are talking seriously about packing the court and, and term limits and other really dramatic reforms to, uh, uh, to the court as an institution. But, you know, how many things could you say that about right now? This is an area none of us had ever lived. I mean, right? The pandemic. I mean, think about how many things that have happened in the last two, three years that, I mean, our kids and grandkids, it's going to be going to be chapters and books about this. So, I mean, uh, the idea that, of course, the Supreme Court term is going to be something else that we've never lived And we haven't <laughs> even talked about the fundamental strangeness that the Supreme Court is going to hold oral arguments Tokyo Olympic style without the public actually there. I know, and that is that, so good. This yeah. is a segue to our first, uh, I'm going to take some questions uh, from our live stream. And then if any of you, while we're talking about this one, want to come to the microphones with questions here in the room, um, uh, as Kenan pointed out, I mean, oral arguments, the justices, Justice Breyer will get to come back on the bench uh, to have his fabulous questions that sometimes go down different, you know, long and windy roads. Um, and there will only be a handful of people in the courtroom for that. Um, and the big question, and this is from Anthony, uh, dear Durf, from, that I think a lot of us have, I know I do, and Kara, you may want to kick this one off, is what's Justice Thomas going to do? One of the great joys yeah. of this weird world they were in doing arguments, you know, in the privacy of their homes going in order was that people were shocked that Justice Thomas knew how to ask really good questions and the other justices seemed to like them and would follow up on them. So what does this mean for, um, are we going to hear more? Do folks think we may hear more from Justice Thomas during oral arguments 
This happened last term, uh, or will it be? What do we think is going to happen? Yeah. We don't. We don't really know, right? Uh, well, you know, he, he he always had great questions. Just he had an audience of four for a mm. long time, and right, it was just right. the clerks got to hear it. And now everyone gets to hear them. My understanding, I I, I think I saw this tweeted somewhere, is they're going to attempt to reenact mm -hmm. their phone, you know, taking turns, civilized manner of having arguments. And I think if they can do that, obviously we'll be able to we'll we'll get to have the pleasure of hearing Justice Thomas while simultaneously at least. A handful of us will get the pleasure of seeing him at the same time. Um, so yeah, it remains to be seen how that's going to work. Uh, but I, I do think it's good to have the court back in a no more normal function. I hope that new system is, is successful. I, I, I have to say I'm a little pessimistic given attempts that they had done. Even remember, this is like before, right, not long before the pandemic, where they attempted to say you can't, let's let them talk for two full minutes. Let's, let's give them have 120 seconds to try to say something before they get interrupted. And even that was unsuccessful. It's, it's kind of like trying to get federal judges to wait till someone's finished their first year of law school before they hire them all up. So it's hard, <laughs> it's hard to do when you have a bunch of people on the court who are used to being, you know, kind of life tenure during good service. And that means you can ask whatever you want, whenever you want. But I do hope maybe out of, out of respect for each other, they'll, they'll follow those rules and we'll, we'll continue to get to hear Justice by, by Thomas. By the time this lunch is over, they're going to be hiring by the end of the first year college carry yeah, exactly so, <laughs> yeah you know it's gonna be really interesting uh, uh, when the court goes back in person I mean one of the things that was really fascinating about last year when the court was acting completely remotely is that the court uh, onboarded a new member during that year and Justice Barrett has not been in the courtroom with her colleagues and so it'll be fascinating to see the interplay, the dynamic between the justices, unfortunately, you know, very few people are going to get to, to see it, but thankfully the court is maintaining the live streaming of the audio, so people will have that form of access, which I think has proven to be uh, uh, really valuable, and I'm delighted that Justice Thomas will have the opportunity to continue to participate in the seriatim questioning, because I think he had an enormous impact at oral argument last year, not least because he's now the senior most justice, and so we got to get his questions in early during the oral arguments. I'll say as an advocate, like, I feel a little bit out of shape with arguing in person. I had my first in-person oral argument last month, and it was just a really strange experience. I've gotten so used to putting on my headset and sitting in my office with all my papers spread out around me and, and sitting down. Um, I forgot that one of the things I don't like about standing up for oral argument is that my feet start to hurt. So maybe I'm going to have to buy some new insoles. But um, it's a, uh, it, it is good, I think, for the dynamic of the court and the dynamic of the decision-making process to have the give and take that you inevitably have in person that the court just couldn't replicate in the telephonic format. Tom, you got some new shoes? <laughs> no, the, the only thing that I think is noteworthy is that because the court is continuing the live stream. I would be shocked if they abandon that even when the pandemic restrictions are lifted and the public returns to the courtroom. It's just so easy for them to do. It's been so non-problematic uh, that it would be, and the only time it went awry was when you could hear a justice flushing their toilet or something, and they're unlikely to do that from the bench. So I think that, uh, you know, I, I think that there, the, and, so, and I agree, it's a good form of public access. That, so that, that, I think, will be one permanent improvement. All right. You want to have the last word, and we're going to throw it to questions. No, no, Anything let's to add? go to the questions. All right, take it away. So we, there seemed to be consensus on the panel that the court sort of relists cases or asks for additional briefing to game out um, when they will hear politically controversial cases. Uh, this strikes me as a kind of way of doing politics to avoid looking like we do politics. My question to the panel is, do you think it works? Um, do the American people buy it? Um, or should the justices just start going back to what they used to do? Who wants to tackle that? I don't, <clears throat> I mean, I do think there is something to the idea that Jan will have a story that says, you know, the Supreme Court over the past, when we get to the end of June, you know, significantly limited row, expanded gun rights, eliminated affirmative action, and dramatically expanded religious liberty. That kind of piling on effect, I think, can draw some attention, but it, it has to be something that extreme, because I don't think the American public is paying nearly enough attention to the Supreme Court, no matter what the individual ideology of the citizen or 
uh, they just, uh, the Supreme Court just never does seem to truly, except at, you know, those few days when it does really, really important things, the Supreme Court just isn't high enough in the public consciousness of the country. And so it's probably pretty much to do about nothing and, and may well be unnecessary. Because I don't think it's a, them feeling overworked or anything like that. They decide so many fewer cases. Uh, but the ch I, I would expect, you know, with no actual concrete information, that this is driven by the Chief Justice who is, uh, you know, quite, quite aware of um, and cares so much about the institution and the institution of the judiciary so, so much more broadly, uh, is well aware of how the court is perceived, is attentive to those sorts of things. And so I would expect that he's made the decision. Uh, and then if it involves, you know, taking fewer ideologically controversial cases or taking them over a longer period of time, then his colleagues to the left are probably, you know, perfectly fine with it. Um, and so I, I doubt that we'll see it change. I think that the, this notion of pacing out uh, uh, decisions is going to hold true both with respect to how quickly they move the law and also how quickly they take on cases in, in the first instance. You know, this may not be uh, responsive, but I'll say it anyway. You know, one thing I've always wondered is that if the court were really concerned about the kind of political focus on its decision making, why does the court sort of have, um, you know, the equivalent of like Shark Week in, in June, where it has this one week <laughs> when it issues all of its big decisions and, and almost guarantees that the attention of the public is going to be on the court at least for that week? And, you know, I think there's a, there is a very benign explanation for that, which is that the court has historically always operated on this term system and the court you know, like my kids, tends to leave its hardest homework until last. And so, you know, those tough decisions end up being in those last couple of weeks of the term. But if the court didn't have that artificial limitation, I mean, imagine a world in which the court would just sort of decide big cases as it was ready to issue opinions. I think the way that we perceive the court would look somewhat different. I think that it, it, that's really the million dollar question that maybe the chief might have one analysis of, if, hey, it's better if these things just don't ever get said out loud. I think that may factor into why they take so few cases. Um, it's like, hey, let's just not, we don't decide these issues. On the other hand, you could say, let's just take a bunch of cases and then they all get lost in the, you know, there's so many things happening that, that you just overwhelm them. Um, so that would be another strategy and I, I don't think we can know necessarily the answer. But I do think in some ways it does, it does feed the perception that justices are doing this as a strategic political kind of uh, kind of thing. And ironically then actually, to my mind, that actually, now in this case, I feel like there's less the, less to be concerned about, again, if, you, if it's just strategic timing of when you take a case that you take, but when it, the closer it gets to merits decisions, the more worrisome I think, and the more it actually opens the door for people to say, hey, if you're, if you're looking at all these things politically, then I'm gonna start making those arguments in this political way. So if, they, if you really thought the only thing they're literally even listening to at all is stuff that's in the briefs, There'd be a lot of amicus briefs, and then there wouldn't be all of the same op-eds and all this stuff. You actually invite more of that the more it looks like it has an effect. And whether it even does or not is, is, is sort of beside the point. If, if the perception is that this is going to have an effect on it, then you're going to get more uh, sound and fury about it. I would just say one more thing on that, um, which is that you know I, I, I think that the fact that the court is taking fewer cases, and Tom can correct my statistics, but I think the last two years the court has had fewer argued cases than it has at any time since the Civil War that have resulted in decisions. It's been less than 60 both years. I think that does have the perverse effect of kind of highlighting the high profile cases. You know, back when the court was taking 140 cases a year, so much of what the court did was sort of the workaday stuff. Um, but nowadays, it seems like the high profile cases are a bigger proportion of the court stock. Yeah. I will say too, in the olden days, the old chief, he, he didn't care if it was a real pain for the media that we had three page one cases released in one day. Like he, mm -hmm. we would, you know, you would get the most, they would just clump them all in. When they were ready, that's when they came out. And I, I do wonder if that's been changed a little, just kind of spread them out or make, maybe the public can understand them better if the media has more time. Uh, but that also has a, a tendency to, to drag out those June days when people can show up and, um, we are supposed to finish at 2, and it is 2, but I'm going to take one more question because you've been standing there, and, and I appreciate it because our conversation has gone well, so we haven't gotten to as many questions. Um, if you want to go ahead and, and sure. have your question, and then, Professor, if you, you guys all want to just have a weigh in with whatever your last words are, and uh, we'll call it an afternoon. Go ahead. Great. Thank you. Um, so we've been talking a lot about possible steps that the justices could take to sort of reduce the 
seeming you know political nature of their job um, and I guess I, I wonder whether we're getting a little too hyper focused on the court itself um, because if you look at most of the way that the justices you know I think dis I mean I think there's a lot of agreement that despite disagreements the justices are trying to get the law right and I think if you look at the way they write their opinions if you're one of the very few people who reads them there are generally reasoned explanations for why they think that's what the law is and so t I guess, I, you know, it's, I'm hard pressed to think of what else the justices could possibly do along those lines. And should we really be more focused on the way that, you know, members of Congress or possibly, you know, certain, you know, members of like the press or commentators on the court, is, is, does, the, does the issue lie more with how people discuss what the court does rather than with, that, rather than with how the justices are doing what they're doing? You want to weigh in? Uh, yeah, uh, ideally, uh, I, I think you might be right, but I think one difficulty with that is the court has the power to constitutionalize issues and essentially take those issues out of the political process. Uh, so therefore, you know, we can't just simply say, well, uh, the court has said this, but we'll simply go to the political process and, 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 and fight it out there. Let's take abortion. Basically, the court in, in Roe steps in uh, and interrupts the political process. Basically says, no, this is outside the political process. Uh, abortion is a right, and it's a right along the lines that we have specified. I know a number of people who are pro-choice, who are quite opposed to Roe because their view uh, is, well, uh, before Roe, we were in the process of having a dialogue about abortion, about when we should draw the line, uh, what considerations we should take into account or not take into account, and the court basically killed that, uh, uh, that process and made it impossible for us to sort of uh, come together in the middle uh, on abortion and uh, decide, okay, uh, this is the consensus about where we're going to draw the line. The court essentially did that and took it out of our hands. So I'm, I'm not sure we could say that, uh, well, the court is sort of separate and we can simply go to the political processes and do uh, what we want there or fight it out uh, in the political realm. I mean, I do think it's a good observation that the justices are doing themselves kind of what they can. Mm -hmm. They're doing their best. They are genuinely sincere about trying to adhere to the law, no matter what their individual ideologies, and they are writing opinions. So that it's a fair point that uh, a lot of this lies with kind of the external mm -hmm. uh, description of what the court is doing. And the difficulty is that there are so many freighted interests here uh, and because people have, from the outside, looking at a decision of the Supreme Court, are obviously, as I mentioned, convinced that they're right, that they, there's a huge inertia towards describing the court as lawless. And when you have a majority of the court change, that's really when, and you know, the court has been growing more conservative for a quarter century and more, obviously, but this is, with the, with the passing of Justice Ginsburg, uh, this is the time when you would expect to see the greatest movement. Mm -hmm. And it is always easier to attack than it is to defend. And so the court is going to come under a really sustained assault uh, from, you know, a, 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 a body politic in the country that believes that the way the law was before was correct and that this is, essentially, is going to characterize the court as political. Um, and so defenders of the court, I think, have the, the biggest challenge. Uh, to try and preserve the legitimacy of the court because the attack is unlikely to be limited to, you know, we disagree with this abortion decision. It is going to be, this is a lawless group of people on the bench. Uh, it's going to be a much more sweeping assault. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with a lot of that. I would say that, you know, if you look at the work of the Supreme Court today and compare it to the work of the Supreme Court when I clerked 20 years ago, yeah, the opinions look pretty similar. Maybe they're a shade more informal today than they were back then. But, but you know, the work of the court is largely uh, the same. And, and I agree with Tom. I mean, we have nine justices on the Supreme Court right now who are all exceptionally smart, who I think act in good faith um, uh, and uh, are, are really doing their best. I think that extends, by the way, to 
the shadow docket for which the court has had some degree of criticism, but you know, when you think about it, the shadow docket is really the expedited docket and you're asking a lot of the Supreme Court when it has to decide major issues of law within a period of, of a few days and I think it's a little bit unrealistic to expect the court to write treatises when it's operating under those circumstances. But, as Tom says, the political world has changed a lot in the last 20 years with the increasing polarization, with the tone of political discourse. And the Supreme Court just doesn't operate in a vacuum from that because as soon as it releases its opinions to the outside world, they are subject to all of those political pressures. And I think that that is, you know, the profound challenge that the Supreme Court faces today is continuing to find its way and to operate in this you know, increasingly sort of frenzied political environment. And I do think that, that the press and the way that it covers the court and, 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 and politicians to the extent that they comment on the court have some responsibility for that. So Jan, can I just add one thing? So Ken and I, I think, agree that the justice as advocates are you know, incredibly intelligent and thoughtful. I just want to say that I also think they're very handsome uh, <laughs> and beautiful and really funny um, and deserve more money. <laughs> that's, that's how I feel about the ones who vote for my clients. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this, you think about it, I mean, I, that's an excellent point. And, and to your point, it's almost like the, the Supreme Court, which is, you know, the opinions look the same. The, there's been major controversy. I mean, we have a tendency in the world we're in to think it's the most bleak, divisive, polarized. There have been pretty divisive times and issues that the court has uh, sorted through uh, even in the last, you know, 50 to 100 years. So, you know, we don't want to go too overboard on this whole institutional integrity, but it is, what is different is some of the commentary on the outside, not only the groups, but mm -hmm. social media, you know, so you've got the Supreme Court, you know, trying to like navigate, uh, you know, in a Twitter world. And, you know, the danger I think is that in, in the challenge for the media, and we don't always do this, is um, how do you convey what the court is doing when somebody's out there tweeting out, you know, 140 characters that they're so adamant that the court is a lawless or whatever they are, and this is the worst decision in the history of America, you know, and, and that's, that ten, that narrative, I think, Professor, you want to make a point? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, yes, it's I wanted to chime in on that. Um, we're assuming, I think we've assumed during this discussion, uh, that Justice Breyer is correct, that there's a public support for the court mm -hmm. and a respect for it as an institution, which I think is, is true, but I, I guess I want to pose a question. I think it's probably true that for at least the last 50 years, uh, we've been taught certain lessons about the court and the Constitution uh, in law schools and before that in, in undergraduate history and political science courses, and even in social studies courses in high school. And it's been one that's been basically supportive of the court and uh, proposing the view that the court, uh, because it is counter-majoritarian, is able to protect rights in a way that uh, the popular branches perhaps are not. Uh, but that narrative has come basically from uh, members of the academy, both the legal academy and, and uh, the arts and science academy, uh, who are basically left of center and who still hold as an image of the court uh, what the court did, uh, what the Warren court did, and to some extent what the Berger court did. Um, as we move further and further away from that, uh, and as the academy becomes less supportive, uh, which, which I think it will and, and has to some extent, and also more to the point, as we listen to other voices uh, that are gonna be more critical uh, of a conservative court, are, is that uh, assumption of public support for the court as an institution uh, going to be less valid? Uh, you know, that, uh, yeah, if, if you do a, a, a snap photograph today, uh, perhaps that's the case, but uh, are we rapidly moving into uh, perhaps another world uh, with respect to that? That's a really interesting point. That's a really interesting point because, you know, in my business too, I think that uh, there's a tendency, you know, let's call a law professor and find out what the answer is. 
you know, that, and, and it really all depends on sometimes what law professor you're talking to, or, you know, what professor, you know, it's, it, it's not like yes or no, the law is not yes or no, here's the right answer. You're going to call someone and they're going to tell you what they wish the answer was or what they hope it may be. But I think for the general public and even for, for general forms of media, um, if you just happen to, there, you know, if you, it depends on what the academia is saying, what their views are, that's going to hold a lot of sway. Anyway, I'm going to let Carrie have the last word. Um, I really do appreciate all of uh, your comments. I, this has been a, a great after early afternoon, a great way to get back into the, the panel presentation thing. I propose, by the way, instead of us socially distancing, we could just be actively drinking for an hour and a half, and then it would have been really interesting. <laughs> but, um, but Lee said no. That it would have been idea. more quotable. Yeah, that was, that was a bad idea. So we'll work on that for next year. The but spirits Carrie, of the law is at work. Next year. Yeah. Next year, right. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think, it's a, I think it's a great question of the chicken and the egg is, is this really, is it the court or is it the way we're all thinking about the court? And I think that's something that, that both Justice Thomas and Justice Barris, Barrett kind of alluded to recently in their comments when they said they both expressed frustration with the court being viewed as political, but expressing it in like, hey, we come up with a decision and you just see the, the end result that you don't like and say, ah, this is just kind of lawlessness or this is, this is them being political. And I think, I, I don't think that's to say that there aren't judges who can have political aspects influencing their decisions in ways that um, I don't think are appropriate. And not always because they're explicitly saying, well, I want to vote my po political way. But as, as Professor Cottrell mentioned earlier, some, for some judges, part of their judicial philosophy is that policy or their their view of justice actually is part of the calculus. So so there are there are situations where they're thinking this is part of my, my rational analysis, but nonetheless it's it's being brought in. So for you know from my perspective, I would say the, the best way to defend against those. Part of it is just sort of a cultural problem that we're seeing in terms of the level of, of hysteria and henny pennying about everything on all sides of the aisle. Um, and I think that's something that we all need to work on. Um, and I don't think the court has the ability to change that cultural drift, unfortunately. Um, but I think also the best, the best thing that it can do in order to push back on that perhaps is just to, to double down on staying the course. And the more um, rigorous it can be about trying to make sure there is a principled legal basis for its decisions. Um, and from my perspective, I think also originalism, textualism provide a, a good solid defense against that because you, you're, you're saying I'm not, I, my own personal uh, policy preferences are not the part that they think we should be looking toward. If you believe that the Constitution evolves, then, and then, then the question is on the basis of what, and I think that allows for an importation of, of personal beliefs in a way that those, those uh, approaches to the Constitution don't. So that would, be, that would be my prescription for getting the court out of this, but obviously it's one that's not shared by all members of the court <laughs> at this point. Um, well, we went 15 minutes over, but I could sit here for another two hours, so we're going to end it now, and I'm going to feel like we really wrapped things up quickly. So I just want to again say thank you to um, all of you guys. Thank you, and thank you guys for coming. It's going to be a great term. That was so great. It was viewers.